we got out to the ship and it was 50 knots gusting to 70 and and the deck was the deck was literally moving 30 feet during his 31 year navy career rear admiral jim flatley flew combat sorties in the f4 phantom he commanded a fighter squadron an aircraft carrier a carrier group and a carrier striking force but perhaps his most memorable achievement came during his time as a test pilot when he landed a huge transport plane aboard an aircraft carrier, something that hadn't been attempted before and actually hasn't been tried since. For insights on this remarkable feat, we wanted to talk to the Admiral himself. So let's get right to it. So Admiral, how did you find out that you were getting tasked with this very unorthodox mission? Well, I'd uh, just finished test pilot school a couple of weeks before and I reported the carrier suitability, which is an element of flight test up there at Patuxent River. Uh, the only place you want to be if you're a test pilot, as far as I'm concerned. The C-130 test came down from CNO, and uh, they kind of made a broadcast right there in front of everybody. Who'd like to have this project? <laughs> and uh, I, quite frankly, everybody thought it was kind of a spoof. So I said, I'll take it. <laughs> Looking for something to do rather than being the coffee mess officer. That was probably the first week in October sometime. And this, we're talking 1963. Three, yeah. Okay. Um, so you, you said it was, everybody thought it was kind of a, a, a spoof. Had you ha heard anything about this around PAX no, before? No, no, that, that was fresh. Fresh through the door, right there at Carrier Suitability. Okay, Just so you're a you're a fighter it. guy, Tigers, Phantoms. Suddenly, you're going to jump into a C-130. Somebody kind of thought this through before it got to Carrier Suitability, and uh, they picked the KC-130 for a very wise reason. It had that big fuel tank. If this was going to be a full blown uh, carrier suitability trials out there on the forest all then we're going to have to go from about 80,000 pounds to 120,000 to demonstrate that uh, we could take a suitable load aboard the airplane if it ever had to be performed. Right. So this is like uh, what you describe as a super cod was the sort of oh. mission that you were doing this proof of concept. Absolutely. Admiral Red Carmody in Oppo 5 came up with the idea. He was working for Admiral Jimmy Thatch, who was Oppo 5 at that time. And Admiral Thatch and my dad were, were best buds. In fact, my dad named the Thatch Weave when they were competing out there in the Pacific for, for which was the best fighter tactic. So did you go through a mini rag syllabus or how did you how did you get smart well, on the the um, KC-130. Lockheed Martin picked up the C-130 and took it to Martin Marietta. And Lieutenant Commander Smoke Stove, my co-pilot, another F-4 guy, we went down to Martin Marietta to get a, a checkout by Ted Limmer, who was Martin Marietta's C-141 chief test pilot. Uh, so we arrived down there. Uh, they'd already made a couple modifications to the airplane. They, if somebody decided it needed a, a smaller nose wheel orifice to uh, cushion the nose wheel a little more and what were going to be our not so hard landings. And they took the, took the uh, fueling tanks off and uh, that, that was about it in terms of modifications. But that was the bear plane was all ready for us. And Ted Limmer put the two of us in the cockpit and uh, off we went at Martin Marietta. And we made a two hour round robin and uh, went through the stalls and a slow flight and uh, all the other things you should do. And, and got back down. He said, it's yours. Take it back to pack. <laughs> That's it, huh? <laughs> so, that's kind of what they taught us at test pilot school. You know, you, you walk in the door there and they hand you seven or eight manuals and say, go fly those eight airplanes the next 10 days and we'll sit down and do some schoolwork. So. 
So you, uh, it was your comfort level was. I, yeah, that, that's a beautiful airplane. And uh, the, the conflict in my mind was here my dad was in another putter about Nav writing the Flatley report that would soon put all of us JOs in the cockpit for the first 11 years of our careers and never let us out of the airplane we started in at the end of our career. So uh, putting ATOPs and standardization things in place and what we were doing at PAX at that point in time just flew in the face of all that. But had some pretty sharp people up there and there weren't that many accidents. But uh, so that that was in my mind the whole way through this. <laughs> I'm not doing what my daddy told me. <laughs> so did you guys develop the the pattern you were going to fly? How did you come up with oh, yeah. glide slope and VSI? What was your scan? You know, how did you guys figure that out? We wondered about glide slope. Uh, so we, we got out there and we found out immediately that 3.5 degree slope was perfect. Uh, there are no wind on the field, dry field, full stop test landings. And we just stuck with that through the whole trials. One adjustment we did make in the airplane after we got to Patuxent was, uh, you know, those big airplanes with a thousand instruments, every one of them is about the size of a 50, 50 cent piece. And we determined we were going to be flying our approaches at three knots above stall. And we wanted a little bigger airspeed indicator you know, one about the size of a kitchen clock. <laughs> so the the flight test engineers came up with something not quite that big, but so we were, you know, we were flying a knot or two this way or that way. So it was nice. That's about all we had our, could have our eyes on. So, so you guys got proficient at the field, just like we would if we were bouncing, getting ready to go to the boat. Uh, right. how, how, how many sorties did you do before you, actually went out to Forrestal. We practiced for 19 days. I, we had 89 full stop test landings at Patuxent River, 89 passes, uh, where we did, you know, max breaks, uh, full reverse, standing on the brakes. Interesting thing about C-130, as far as air crew coordination, uh, once you're on deck, the pilot has to go down like this for the nose wheel steering. It's almost down by your left foot. Uh, so the co-pilot would fly the wings because we were going to have 40 knots over the deck. Airplane was flying through part of the landing. So so that little bit of air crew coordination we developed at, on the field there at uh, Patuxent and uh, proved worthy of our efforts. So you were... You were flying left seat? Yep. Who was in the right seat? Smoke Stovall. Okay. And his background was what? It was fighters. We both went into F-4s for Vietnam from that point. Uh, I think Smoke was a, a F-3H pilot at that point. Um, so two two dumb fighter pilots. <laughs> I, now, I'd been a... I started out my career as an LSO, and I, I was one for 11 years, long after leaving PAX. So so that helped a little bit. This was your first shore duty. Yeah. You'd cruised on Intrepid in an F-11 squadron. F-11, and two deployments, F-11, one F-8s. Okay, okay. About an exactly 300 landings and three deployments. So Smoke was about the same proficiency in that regard. So, as you mentioned, the three and a half gl degree glide slope, which is our standard glide slope, uh, works. So you're going to use that. Meatball lineup angle attack, is, is that your scan for this evolution? Or did you have to change no. how you were going to do that? Yeah, that's everything exactly the same. That's, that's what made it such a piece of cake. We'll get out the ship with very few hours and terrible conditions, but... Uh, you know, fighter pilots can do anything. Forrestal is located where? Off off Jacksonville. Okay, and it's a it's a pretty high wind, high high sea 
day. Well, that was kind of surprising. The, the, the flight deck was absolutely bare. Jerry Doherty, who was another test pilot in carrier suitability, was carrier suitability's LSO. So he was out there to keep an eye on things. We got out to the ship and it was 50 knots gusting to 70 and and the deck was the deck was literally moving 30 feet. I didn't make many F-11 or F-8 approaches in those conditions. They didn't say, look, let's cancel today, come back when it's no, less than this? You no, know, when you send the whole air wing away, you're, you're wasting a lot of flight deck time. So let's see. Wow. let's see how the touch and goes go. We all know that no matter the sea state, every once in a while, the, the deck kind of steadies out. I did uh, 42 passes that day in those conditions to get 19 touch and goes. I think uh, probably 15 of those were on the angle deck, and they, they said, okay, let's do a couple on the axial deck. I don't know if they were thinking about that 15 feet wingtip clearance between, between the island and, and my right wingtip. And we pulled those off uh, with a few extra wave offs because of the conditions. So 42 passes, 19 touch and goes. So back to Patuxent, we flew. That was about a, man, that was about a five and a half hour flight for this old fighter pilot. <laughs> Interesting for me. Yeah, no, it's a lot of time in an airplane. So yeah. just to explain for the viewers, you, you mentioned angle deck and axial. So the angle deck is you're flying relative to the ship normally as we would when we're coming aboard. And then axial is you're actually flying down the longitudinal axis of the ship down the bow. And right. that's the point where you only had 15 feet of wingtip clearance from the island. Yeah, that's all we had. But they, <laughs> interesting, you know, the ship's got a center line, and uh, which we're all supposed to stay on. But they got out the paint buckets and made that center line about three feet wide. So so I, I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't miss it. They made it fighter pilot a foot or so. I was still on the center line. So that first sortie, you guys didn't stop. You were just doing touch and goes. Did, you didn't actually no, stop. No, on no. That. no, and that was the intention from the onset. Okay. Let's get that touch and go data. Take it back to backs. Flight engineers ring it out on their computers and okay, telemetry and all that sort of stuff. And and then when did you come back for the the sortie where you started actually stopping on the flight well, deck? It was a matter of getting the deck again. So it was about 10 days later. We got seven landings, the full stops of the second time out with the intention of stopping. All of those were, of course, on, on the axial deck at three knots above stall on approach. So what was that? What was that speed, roughly? Well, the first approach, 79 knots with 40 knots of wind over the deck. So your closure is minimal with Absolutely. the ship. That's why we stopped in 279 feet the first time. Okay. Would paddles give you a cut or, you know, you go into beta before you cross the ramp? How did that go? Because that sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> um, we did take a cut and uh, I'm guessing Jerry gave us the cut right at the ramp, but it, it had to be a little bit before that because uh, we consistently touch down 50 feet from the ramp, uh, which which you don't do normally uh, in, in your carrier wing ops. The, all of us are, you know, the first wire is 120 feet up the deck or something. So your scan on the approach, meatball, big fat axial lineup, and not angle attack, but like gigantic clock size airspeed. Is that how you're working your scan? That's right. You get the cut call, go to beta, and then you're landing feet on the brakes. Is that how that yeah. kind of worked? Yeah, they were on there simultaneously with touchdown. So I guess the C-130 had a pretty nice anti-skid system, or was oh, it modded yeah. for this yeah. operation? They did upgrade the anti-skid system in the airplane in addition to the nose wheel orifice. You said you stopped in about 200 or so feet. Are you a beam the island at that point? Are you still short no. of the island? How did that go? No, not on those first landings. When we uh, when we got up to that 120,000 gross, we were rolling out to something over 600 feet. 
Oh, okay. And that put us abreast the island. Was it kind of hairy? I mean, were you like oh, you, you, you? You couldn't see it. You didn't, you didn't know. You're just trusting that the center line is going to give you. Just know you were on the center line. Okay. Right? Yeah, that was your responsibility. You stay on the center yeah. line. Amen. Hopefully, they painted it right. So now you're Amen. aboard. And how did you get back airborne? We used reverse thrust to put ourselves in in a takeoff position. Did you have uh, a yellow shirt out there? Like, okay, well, stop. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, the interesting thing about takeoffs, which we never practiced on the field because it was a given, the captain told us, I don't want you rotating till you get by the island. Otherwise, we could have been waving at him every time we took off. <laughs> but uh, but we'd, we'd get back on a stern and, and take her to full power and release brakes. And we could have been rotating at uh, 46 knot indicated. The, that reminds uh, me, I, I did one deck run in in my life off of Kennedy when I was uh, my first tour. And so we flew off in C1s yeah. and uh, down the angle, looking out that little porthole, you know, going, going, going. And wow. <laughs> there goes the island, going, going, going. And then suddenly you're airborne. That was quite a feeling, you know. I only did that once. Test complete. You make your report, and the Navy does what, ultimately? Interesting, they kept it quiet for a year. And uh, the reason for doing it in the first place had gone away. What, so when you said the reason, are we talking supercot? Are we talking nuke delivery? What, I mean, what? Because well, that the, was another I, sort of use I, of the C-130 was roll a nuke out the back. No, the, no the, the real reason, and I didn't find this out for five or six years, and I don't think anybody else found out about it longer than that. While we were doing this on the East Coast, on the West Coast, the U-2s were care calling. Okay. It was happening at the same time. Yeah. So they were looking for a way to support the U-2s if that ever became a common operation. Ah, okay. Okay. That makes sense. Engines and whatever. So that didn't happen. So therefore, the C-130 part didn't happen. Yeah. And like I say, that community didn't want anything to do with it. But I think they would rethink that now with the, the deck expanse and and with, you wouldn't be interfering with the air wing if you worked off the angle. I still s salute the idea. Well, Admiral, you're the patriarch of an amazing naval aviation family. I look like a patriarch. I'm you, sorry. You kinda, <laughs> but I mean that in the best way. You're looking good. <laughs> um, thank you for taking the time to recount this amazing C-130 evolution when you were a test pilot. And thanks for coming by the channel today. Well, thank you for what you do. You, you, you do a great job. I can see why you're so popular. Well, thank you, sir. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. If you're a first time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch and also where to get the Punk's Trilogy, my first three novels about life in an F-14 squadron. Now available as a Kindle for the first time at Amazon.com, so check that out. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the Super Thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at Patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.